It definitely evolved. It's like a two acre farm initially, and now it's 500 over two decades. So it's like gradual growth. It wasn't really ever as big. We didn't intend it to ever get this big. So it's kind of a lot to juggle. Um, and it's not like ideal in all cases, but um, we make it work. Maybe we'll downsize a little bit. That's probably like in the next five years, we'll just downsize. It's just too much to manage right now. Can you think you set up two acres yeah. for 500 yeah. now? Wow. In two decades. Yeah. Wow. Man. 500. 500. 500. Oh, okay. It's all spread out. It's right here, 60 acres. And oh, okay. this is our only property we own. The rest of it we rent. And it goes back to the almond sports collective. That's the, the next parcel over. Um, and so here we have a combination of orchard and row crops and a big pack of asparagus. Nice. Oh, wow. How long has the asparagus been in there? Um, it's probably on its fourth year. Pretty young. But getting good harvest from it. And what else about it? beginning? Um, well, Yachtville is where we started, and there was this great hundred tree mixed fruit orchard. Um, that's where we learned how, to about how different trees produce what they produce differently, like how to prune them differently. So that was like plums, figs, persimmons, peaches, and then we sold the restaurants over there, and then um, did the farmers market in Napa and San Diego, and then. Started. Those were seasonal markets, so we started a CSA because people wanted to continue to get the stuff in the winter, and we wanted to produce year-round, and we could do that in this climate. And um, Tim and I are both from the Midwest, so we don't have farming backgrounds. We just really enjoyed it as we went. It's a lot of trial and error. So you started with orchard, and then you moved into it. We managed one orchard, and we had row crops on two acres. Okay. So it was kind of like three acres altogether. But where we lived in Yonville, there was an orchard that people needed to manage, so it was like full of bone and like already there. established orchard. Yeah. So it gave us a really good um, like learning experience. And yeah. I'm not a reporter, by the way. I know. Are you still going to help me report? And neither am I. That's fine. Tell them the story of appearing as a result. Oh, of this. I should say, like when we bought this place, nothing was here except for the old house. So we built this. And we built the greenhouses, and we have a mobile office in the back. That's kind of that's all the it looks like. It's <laughs> barred windows, and it's too small. Like we've outgrown that space, so that's definitely like there's always room for improvement and modification, and we have a lot of um, refining of the systems that still need to happen. Even though we like have a net profit most years and like we're an established farm. We have an established market. It's just everything constantly needs to be fun. So let's check out the package show and we can sample things as we go. Basic, these are all panels. Um, 
So we just assembled it and have the integration person set up their cooling in it. And as we needed more space, we added more coolers. It was all kind of based on demand. Do you have coolers at different temperatures? Yeah, all of them are just um, Some of the stuff we're harvesting right now is spinach, arugula. This is our grazing mix. It has kales and chards and Asian greens. Beautiful. And then we have all the bunch greens, collards, chards, red brush and kale. We grow like over a thousand varieties. So it's easier if we grow, grow fewer. A thousand varieties of? Stuff, produce. Oh, wow. <laughs> because like the tomatoes alone, that's our main crop in the summer. We grow like 40 acres of tomatoes alone. And within the tomato category, we grow like 200 varieties of tomatoes, including the cherry tomatoes. So we do like a, an assorted pack, we call it mixed heirloom, and then we do like a mixed cherry box, it's called toy box. Yeah. Um, so we're washing spinach, lettuce, um, we're packing for CSAs twice a week. Um, we do. We don't customize our CSA box. We just do one thing, and that we just we haven't really adapted. The market really wants people like to, customers want to be able to specify what they get in their box, but we haven't gotten there yet. Other farms do that. KP Organics does that. They, they're just a little more sophisticated with their database and their system. But we're a little bit. We don't even take credit cards. Still, we're kind of like behind the times on that. There's been a lot of talk about like CSAs and demand for CSAs and what's happening sort of in the region. Are you finding that you have the same? Are you finding that you have folks leaving or coming or there's what's sort of? There's a lot of attrition, but there's constantly more like renewed interest. So that's good. Just, people, we have a lot of old customers though, like longtime customers that have done it for 15 years. Yeah. And then we have people that just try it for a month and then they don't it doesn't work for their it doesn't fit their schedule or whatever. So yeah, there's a turnover. Yeah. In, in our packing shit itself we have really primitive technology. We have a spinner for washing the spinach and the lettuce. And then we just use these uh, wash tanks um, filled with water that we use the water So really love like that. How is your water situation? We mostly use wells. This place has a really good agricultural well. And then a lot of the other parcels that we rent are on the creek. So we irrigate the creek this year. We have to limit that because the creek level is so low. Uh, on, uh, irrigation district. Irrigation, well, Cash Creek is essentially irrigation district because oh, okay. um, <laughs> Clear Lake is the water that all Cash Creek's water comes from, I mean, other than rainfall. Okay. So Clear Lake water is released, and that's what regulates the flow of the creek all throughout the summer. And how far are you from the Class 5 rapids? Um, there's a lot of rafting that happens up in the canyon. Uh, Not that far, like 20 minutes. Wow. Yeah. But I don't think it's Class 5. There is some Class 5 on Cash Creek. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's all like 20 minutes away. Oh, wow. Um, this is our meat area. I'm going to show you all the food areas first, then we'll do the dirty stuff. Um, this is fairly new. We, we started doing the animals, like I said, in 1998. That was chickens. And then probably eight years ago, we started doing um, the pigs. So we built this, we poured this pad. This is an old box truck from a, a truck that we no longer use. That's our egg washing. Oh. <laughs> And then we added these, this is a sea container that we turned into a freezer, or a cooler. And then that end, we partitioned it off and we turned it into a freezer. So it's actually one of those sea containers that goes on those big freight liners. Ah, but you insulated. We insulated it on yeah. the outside. That's why it looks like a fungus. Like a shipping container. Yeah. I've never seen that. <laughs> but just, you gotta get creative when you yeah, right. don't have the resources to do all those, because all those things add to the cost. Oh my god, I that. <laughs> so awesome. we finished this so this could all be washable surfaces. Really? This is like a wash wash wall board. And then we put the tile in. And then this is the egg. 
washing machine. Wow. I used to wash a lot of your hands. Huh? I'll take a picture for Blair. Yeah. <laughs> we have 2,000 laying hens, wow. and um, yeah, we we actually don't have enough. The demand for fresh eggs, pastured eggs, exceeds like what we can raise. So there's a few if you ever want to go into it. That would be one thing I recommend going into is just um, pastured eggs. So. We line them up here, and then this conveyor belt carries them into here. And these are the come in. And these are the um, little brushes that you've used this, haven't you? <laughs> I've spent a lot of time in this. Thing. Yeah. Okay, I thought so. And then those are the brushes, and then the spray comes out of that pipe. And then the um, this is the dryer. The blow dries them, and then they roll out here, and then we pack them here. So we don't have any collected right now for you to see, but I'll show you when we go out there. If you don't mind asking, how much is this one? This is ten thousand. Wow. Ten thousand. It paid for itself like in a month. It was yeah. wow. definitely worthwhile yeah. investment. And there's a water heater. You can adjust the temperature of the water. You can add soap if you want to, but we don't do that. And how much? How much you sell your eggs for? Right now we just went up because the feed is going up. So we are charging eight dollars a dozen. We went up to eight too. Yeah, and then nine for jumbo. Uh -huh. And then if they're really small, the pellets, we do six. So I'll show you the freezer. Oh, and then we have this is, this is our vacuum packer for packing meat. Wow, oh, nice. It's a really nice machine. Um, it hasn't broken on us yet. Um, we do our chicken in those steel bags. Yeah, you're right in here. Most of our pork is that um, we haven't sold yet. There's sausage in there, there's ham steaks, there's big hams, um, and then we do pork shares. We do. This is a mix of, it's like a prepared box of mixed cuts. So it has sausage, pork chops. <laughs> Um, and then we put a number on there and then the weight and so we, we give people who are interested in buying meat that menu It's like a menu and then they select which one they want If they want hawks or whatever we don't customize them for the re by request We just say this is what we have and we'll pick the one you want Are there some for sale today? Yeah, all these oh, are for yeah. sale. This is inventory. Ooh, great. Nice. All this stuff is not pre-sold. So these are yeah, okay. So I can show Wait. you. I can go we'll come back the, after. But there's also yeah. just like little cuts if you want to get a handful of pork chops. Thank you. Joe, <laughs> you had a question there earlier that was it? Oh, and then as far as processing the meat, we don't have our own like in house butcher. So what we do is we send the live animals to Orland. They get slaughtered there. That's like a two and a half hour trip. So they go in the trailer, get slaughtered, then the whole animals go to Manus Ranch. You probably passed it as you came in, in Esparto. And they do the cuts, and they actually vacuum pack the cuts, and that's super handy. And then we just sell the cuts at market or in the pork shares. And then the chickens go to a different processing facility in Sacramento. It's called um, New American Poultry. And do you meat birds to release the laying hens? We do meat birds that are separate varieties, separate breeds. Yeah, the laying hens we do slaughter after two years, but they're more for stew, stew meat. They're yeah. not very tender. This is another freezer. That when we have like overstock of some of the pork, and then we have a lot of the um, our chickens, gizzards, stuff that doesn't sell very well. <laughs> a lot gizzards, of fat. and then a lot of fat, and um, we save all our pork bellies, and that goes to yet another processing place. It goes to. Um, Drive it up to Fort. Once we get so so the animals are done at Manus and they leave the pork bellies whole there. They don't do the bacon, and then we accumulate let's say 20 pork bellies, and we drive them up to Fort Bragg. <laughs> and then they are they stay there like a week at Roundman Smokehouse, and then we go pick them up. So it's a lot of fuel usage and time. But people really like, they do a really good job. They smoke the everything. Dance. Yeah, they smoke um, fish and turkey and pork and everything. Have you 
sausages at Manus Ranch? Yeah, they do those there. We used to do them at the Mad Butcher in Sacramento, but it just became more convenient to like be 20 That's minutes fun. away instead of an hour away. Have pasture to rotate the chickens into. So what we do is have a block where they are for several months and they graze and fertilize and then once they're done in one area, we move the whole setup over to another block. So they actually are moved within the block and then the whole block moves. You said they stayed for about a month? Well, several months. They, they stay like in that one spot. Like right now they're in a row and they stay there for a month. And within that block, we'll move them like five times. So five months or so. And then we just pass on the left. That's kind of like permanent herbs down there, and then this is just ground we're working up for the next thing. Um, Trini, what's the pasture you planted here? Is it, um... This, this is just plain old grass. This is okay. like rye grass. But over where we have the permanent pasture, more permanent is alfalfa, clover, and we'll see. I think there's a rye grass as well. Got it. What size pipe do you use? The, our main line, I think, is a five inch. Mm -hmm. And then aluminum pipe is three inch. Okay. And we don't sprinkle or irrigate everything. A lot of it's on drip. Beautiful veggies. <laughs> yeah, they're amazing. They're yeah. great. Do you, do you bury the drip? Not for all the stuff. Okay. For some things we do, like for tomatoes and peppers and it can be do. Okay. But this time of year it's all um, Look at this. Mostly Beautiful. Rain, great rain watered. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully we get enough rain in this wow. rain water, but we, we have had to irrigate a lot this winter. Beautiful rose. Yeah, so right now it's mostly like spinach, leafy greens, a lot of carrots, beet, um, asparagus, broccoli. We're out of potatoes. We just planted them. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a hand weeder, like a hand weeder crew that comes in or? Our, this is just we use hose, hose and tractors. Really? Like when stuff's small enough, we tractor cultivate. And yeah. then when it's bigger, we go through and hand hoe. That's cool. And um, Trini, do you have like a larger system with the chickens where, for example, this kind of the right side that they're on right now, will that eventually be um, like vegetable fields? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, like right here, the chickens used to be right here in this block. So the whole permanent pasture, well, we call it permanent, but it's not permanent forever. It's permanent for a year or so. Okay. Yeah, so like this was all where they were for a year uh -huh. recently. And then we planted peppers and then we planted these greens. Got it. But they do like totally, you can see just the visual difference of the fertility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. they make a huge difference. Chicken poop is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> And because of that, do you not have to add further compost to the soil? Or um, we're trying to reduce it. Okay. But we still have to in some places where the, we don't get a chance to bring the chicken. Got it. Got it. Oh, I wanted to tell you guys about a new thing we did last year, right here in this corner. It was um, onion seeds for a company in Europe. We just did. They wanted to rent a little plot, and we planted the onions for them and manage them and it was very lucrative. <laughs> it was surprisingly lucrative because they paid to rent the ground and then they paid per pound like how much seed was harvested wow. and it's so high value it just like paid for itself. It was so we're hoping to do that again. They're wow. called Vitalis. It was a European company. Yeah, Vitalis. I They're coming here to do that. Oh, they have fields all over like the country. Like yeah, all over the world like they knew, they have this new person that does see uh, grower relations and he, he knew us from Cape Bay Organic. And so he's like, how about you guys do this little trial plot? And it was, it yielded really well. So we hadn't even, that hadn't occurred to us as a crop. Like we're always thinking crop for human consumption, but then that could be something different and new. <laughs> called June Prize. It's really flavorful and it produces huge peaches. And this June orchard is probably, well some of the older trees, the bigger trees are probably like six years old. Oh, 
Let's have to show you the greenhouse. We'll circle around and do that. Do you net them? Um, like this? Like, I don't know what this is. That's just to hold the branches up. It's just Hi. twine when they're loaded with fruit, then they, it prevents them from breaking. Some people <laughs> use props, but we just tie them. So all these guys are from a Davis hatchery called Vega. Oh yeah. And they all lay brown eggs. And they're all the same generation. They're just starting to lay. They're like eight months old. Wow. And they're sex links? I don't know. They're called Vega Browns. Vega Browns. I don't know if they're sex links. And so you end up with you doing fertilized eggs? Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. We assume they all are because we have a handful of roosters and they're busy. <laughs> and then we built these. These are old trailer beds from mobile homes or trailers and we just tore them down and then built new coops on top of them. And so, you know, a question that, that a lot of beginning farmers that come to talk to me are like, oh, we're going to do, we're going to do laying, we're going to do laying hens. Mm -hmm. And then they get into it and then the feed cost is put them under and they I can't know. do it. So how do you guys make it work? It barely works. It's like just breaking even. Yeah. Hmm. But I was just telling her that there are other advantages that aren't really quantifiable, like the fertility. And so we just have to... And also, like, at a stand at the market, like, if you have eggs, it draws people into the, that, and then they buy other stuff. So it's almost like a commercial <laughs> for to help sell other products. So you have to kind of figure out, okay, well, those are benefits, too. And so as long as it pays for itself. For yeah. I would say so. And maybe having more pastures, like sometimes folks are doing it, and they don't have as much land to move the animals around. Yeah, but they do need to buy grain. Like, there's something, the pasture just does not give them the full nutrient yeah. spectrum that they need. Like, they just, they lay, like, their egg laying was better with supplements. Yeah. But if you want to buy conventional feed, then it would, of course, be a lot cheaper. <laughs> um, but we try, we don't do that because ours are certified. Um, I was just telling her, like, if we really wanted it to be profit more, like, on pencil and paper profitable, we would um, not do the organic feed. Mm -hmm. But then it's sort of like going against all the principles of the whole thing. <laughs> Let's look at the kids. Trini, about how many chickens in each house would you say? 250. 250? Yeah. in there collecting, let's go to the other one. There's not that much food. Do you have a problem with uh, the roosters? Yeah. They have enough space. They what? They have enough space. Uh -huh. I think if they were confined, then they would be a problem. We have these nest boxes in, um, from, what's it called? Oh, it's, like, it's an Iowa company too. Like the egg washer. Um, but they, they have a great design because the nest box is sloped so the egg rolls forward and then we hand collect all the eggs but it's usually in the front part of the, in the tray of the box. And then at night, those little roosts fold up and that keeps them from going into the boxes at night. So they're not pooping in there. Yeah, keeps it cleaner. one spot and then we 
at night they go in and roost, so we close the doors and then we hook up the tractors and we pull them to the net. Yeah, it's already been pretty hard to but the next spot will tell you. I think it's a little bit older than it. It might not bounce back, but it's okay because I think once they're done grazing the whole thing, we'll just till it and yeah, we'll, we'll plant it to pots. And we'll move the whole perimeter fence to a block over there. So you won't just you won't just move these guys internally within the fenced area, you'll actually move to a different boat. But initially they just grazed the, the fenced area until it's pretty well mown and then we move the whole block. Like after a year. Let's see, we'll go out we'll go out this gate. Yeah, I find that with my chickens, they'll usually just graze right around where the coop is. Yeah. Even if they have this huge paddock, so you kind of have to move them within the paddock. Yeah, they have a so, small radius. Yeah. yeah. They like to stay close to the coops for protection, because we have a lot of hops. Uh, and then for rain, too, just weather and predation protection. Yeah, I was going to ask, I noticed you don't, you don't have electric fencing, so you, do you not have... We tried that. Uh -huh. We used to do that, and it just, the birds would fly over it. It wasn't tall enough. So we didn't want them getting into the production crops. Oh. So then we put up this taller um, mesh gear set. And the bottom is lined with chicken wire. We're still trying to like tighten it up, but um, we do have some losses. Some um, predation uh -huh. is inevitable because we have fox, coyote, right. hawks, we have skunks, and possums, and even the crows. It's like better getting chicks. Yeah, well that and they will well, get the egg. They'll oh. go in the coop and they'll like take an egg with their beak. And they'll fly away with this big egg. Oh <laughs> my gosh. That's so silly. I yeah. lost a chick with the crow. Yeah. So sad. They're pretty clever crows are. Mm -hmm. We raised meat birds last year and the biggest thing like um kind of surprised to me was that skunks ate when their when our meat birds were still about pullet size, about three yeah. weeks old. The skunks I didn't realize bur burrow right underneath them and just, just yeah. get them, you know, and I skunks are pretty aggressive. Yeah, it's yeah. horrible. They're, like, they're carnivores. Yeah. And they're so small too so they can get in through all these like little tight spaces. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. How is this fencing staying? Like, is it staying intact well, or does it break over time? It's temporary. Yeah. So it's not. It's not a good permanent solution. The deer actually just jump through it. Oh, terrible, they break holes there. You're eating your egg. Get out of here. <laughs> I think there's a good solution. Hawks. You may have nipped in the butt uh, once. I don't know what the thing is. The hawks not so much. When they're full size, when they're smaller, it's more of a risk. Um, so these coops are different from the ones we saw with the laying hens because we have um, propane heat units and it's because we get 500 meat birds a week. Do the J J R J M J M the Red Rangers Freedom, Freedom Rangers. Freedom. Yep. 500 meat birds, meat chicks a week. Yep. And this is where they start out. Um, so we have that same watering system with the little metal nipples oh. and then the propane heaters so we can keep it warm for them. Propane. Oh, you guys are starting. And it's all the same variety of the same breed. We used to do Cornish but they just didn't fare very well. They didn't have enough feathers in the winter and they couldn't walk. Oh. They were great because they sized up quickly. These guys take longer to size up, but we, we just couldn't handle the loss. What time did you say that? This is Freedom Ranger. Freedom. They're also called Poulet Rouge. The French know them as Poulet Rouge. <laughs> <laughs> the French have a beautiful name for them. <laughs> This is yeah. They're part of that the back in the sixties, right? The red, red the red, red label program, I think, for like preserving so. those meat genetics. Yeah. And yeah, they're really tasty birds. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of yellow fat, and yeah. it makes it more flavorful. And how many um, do you have here in each of the tractors? Five hundred. Five hundred in each. They come. That's how many come each week. <laughs> I love this setup. You know, I've only ever um, raised meat birds in like the Joe Salatin style chicken tractors. Well, we do that eight eventually. Eight. Okay, yeah. so they go up. Yeah, oh, right I now it's just their young, like vulnerable time, and then as they get bigger, we move them out into those mobile oh, cages. And those we move like once a week. 
So they're like rotating through the pasture within their little hut. That's the best. So the best. they're distended. <laughs> and do you, um, is this an, an, a working orchard? Uh, um, yeah. Oh yeah, walnuts yeah. and almonds. Okay. Yeah. So we have to get them out of here 140 days beforehand. Yeah, that whole thing. Yeah, like 20 times. 30 times four. Yeah, like four months ahead of time before harvest. Does the Food Safety Modernization Act, does that affect um, you at all? You mean, well, we have to implement a good agricultural practice plan, which we've done. Yeah. It's just more like paperwork. I was going to say, more we're already paperwork. like pretty much doing the stuff that's required, but now we have to document it. Okay. Have you had inspectors come up for that? Yeah. Yeah, two years in a row we've had um, Series International, they come and check everything. Oh, that's a third party yeah. wow. certifier? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've had sponsored some um, workshop, like food safety workshops. Yeah. I think it's kind of like the big, the, the kind of big name now out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> topic of concern. Because yeah. the wholesalers are starting to require it, and yeah. they're going to get to the point where they won't buy our stuff if yeah. they don't have certification. Yeah, we sell to Whole Foods, even though we're a small farm, and Whole Foods requires food safety plans. So, yeah. And it's easy for small farms, even though it's more paperwork. It's just kind of like you just write down what you're doing, and yeah. it's not that. But. So how does the um, how do the meat birds versus the egg, the layers, work out um, financially? Um, the eggs make more. They make more. Yeah. These we harvest at like 14 weeks. Um, we were charging five per pound. Now we're up to six per pound to try to make it pencil out better. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, the eggs are just, I think they're higher value, yeah. like what, what we get from each hen, mm -hmm. and two years of the 90 day. Yeah. Organic feed for the yeah. meat birds. All the animals are certified organic. Mm -hmm. Hi guys. And you said earlier that these are processed through New American Poultry? Yep. And it's kind of a bummer working with them because they don't, something is going on with their line where they actually damage the birds sometimes. Like they break a leg or a wing or... So you get them in there yeah. sometimes. Yeah, and then like we're having to pay the full price for getting an animal that's not really whole. Mm -hmm. Sometimes skin will be missing. So then the restaurants that are selling either like the whole animal oh, yeah. or cuts, they just like, we can't buy it for like the same amount. So then we have like a second run. Mm -hmm. So I wish we had other options. Processes. That's like the closest one. And then this is what we transport them in. Oh, okay. On a trailer. To be slaughtered. Yeah. And those big white crates that were back there for the... Oh, home? those are bins? Are That's for our winter oh, squash storage. Okay. Just get worried. <laughs> And do you move the you move these every so often? They just stay here. Okay. They're pretty stationary. Uh -huh. There's still so much forage. I guess they're not eating that much forage at this age. Not yet. Or, yeah. They're trying to, but, yeah, but it's a little too big. If it had, if it was mown, they might be able to get at it better. But I think they're getting bugs. Oh yeah. Versus like the green stuff. Uh -huh. Do you have a sense of what proportion of the diet of the more mature of these meat birds consists of the forage as opposed to the I'd say mostly feed. feed. Mostly yeah, I mean, they, like in each day that they're in a spot, they'll yeah. mow that whole spot yeah. where their cage is, like mm -hmm. the size of the cage. Never run into those. No. <laughs> it's hard. Yeah, no. I mean, Too you hard got, to quantify. You got your hands or... full, but. <laughs> we need a person to do all that stuff, all that cost accounting. <laughs> cost accounting specialist. You should date as graduate student. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Project. <laughs> Trini, I was going to ask you one of the, the big things that. Um, that question that people ask is like trying to figure out how to scale up and like you know, how do these folks are like tiny. You know, well tiny but also one of the things that we try to like kind of impress on people is that you know farming is an investment farming uh -huh. is a business and it takes a while to, to get a return and, and that you need to expect exactly that you're going to have to invest some capital yes. on the front end yeah you don't get paid right away because you have to buy your equipment it took us 10 years to go out of debt okay that's what yeah. I'm wondering it took a long time. We basically like we're making money each year, but we still had like you know we were buying more equipment. It was like all those investment years, okay. so it takes a long time. Okay. Yeah. Would you advise you know the idea of uh, leasing an already producing orchard versus like as a new farmer going in and trying yeah, to start? Yeah, that an would definitely be like 
less hot, less output. Yeah. Um, and it would be a way to like shore up your belt, like just to have income early on, mm -hmm. where you're not doing a lot of capital outlay. It's a higher cost lease per acre or something yeah. initially, but yeah. then you don't have the startup costs. Yeah. Um, Trini, kind of piggybacking off of Susan's question, and I'm sorry, you know, this is too personal, like you don't have to okay. answer it, but um, you and Tim, before you started, I mean, was there, did, did you save up money for this endeavor, or did you have jobs no, before? No, we had job. We had jobs, okay. like, simultaneously. We weren't solely farming initially. Uh-huh. His uncle and aunt had a, like, food distribution company, Frank Chef Food. Uh-huh. So we worked for them. And then we also installed gardens for restaurants. Oh, cool. So we just uh -huh. had, like, additional income for the slower times of the year. Got it. We uh, could determine our own hours so that it gave us flexibility to uh -huh. um, focus on farming when we needed to. Got it. And, and so eventually you were kind of able to just kind of quit your day job and yeah. farm full time? Yeah, we, once we moved over here, we basically went from like 10 acres at that point, like to 2 to 10 in 5 years, and then over here we rented a 30 acre place. And then we just kept on finding more places to rent. And yeah, the rent's like average is 200 per acre per year. 200 per acre per yeah, year? in this valley. Okay, that's not bad. Yeah, it's definitely affordable. We'll start with the potting mix. We do all our own mix. It's um, coconut. Uh, what do you call them? Fiber? The husk, thanks. And then vermiculite and perlite, and we just sort that. It's like a nutrient-less mix, and then we add the nutrients. I'm here. What kind of nutrients do you add? Um, we do like a liquid fertilizer. And I want to show you this. This is my mother. Listen it up. Um, we built this little hot box, and it's, it's where we start all our training. And it's heated and insulated, so oh, all the wow. trays go in there. It's 90 degrees, wow. temperature controlled. I mean, we can adjust the temperature, but um, this is where they all sprout. And once there's like five in each tray coming through the surface, then we bring them out. But it just makes for a more even germination. <laughs> Simple. Do you try to get an early start on the tomato season? Yeah, we start them in January. January, okay. And then these are melons. Cucumbers and melons. Hi. Quinquil <laughs> and roses. These are all of the tomatoes. We just kind of this. We've already filled this seeding and we've yeah. Yeah. Do you cover them at night or? No, ours aren't covered. We just have pipes set up in case it frosts. We set, we run sprinklers. Oh, got Bow it. Bow Belly covers theirs and they're, they get like a little head start because they're more, it's covered with this stuff. The Rime. They're warmer. Yeah. There's a volunteer tomato from last year. <laughs> it's really big already. So you can see the different varieties like this. See how it doesn't have the pointed leaf? Mm -hmm. This is the, um, one of the heirlooms. I think it's one is it? It's green giant. It looks a lot like the brandy wine leaf. Where do you buy your seeds from? A whole bunch of different sources. Mm -hmm. Johnny's. Um, Johnny's is the main one. Yeah. I'll show you the seed inventory. Real. Order every year, but some stuff we use from previous years. So this is like the temperature controlled, rodent controlled zone. Wow. It always smells good in here. Oh my God. And they're musty. Wow, nice. Let's see. Yeah, they're organized by type. So, we don't disturb them too much just because they'll get, they're sleeping right now. But the piglets are back there with the mom in the last section. And this is where, when the weather's not that great, we bring the moms that are about to give birth, and this is where they give birth. So each little stall has a heater and a heater and a water, so the moms can be sheltered. So can go in there. It's kind of like a little farrowing hut. Yep, farrowing. Farrowing. Go ahead. 
up your future green. Set up these protein feeders so that the piglets can get separated from their, or be separate from their mom. Um, and they just go in here. That, this decreased their chances of getting squished. squished. They're all sleeping. So these look like they have some of the like European wild boar in them. Yeah. Or something. The black. Yeah. And these guys are just born today or yesterday. Oh my goodness. He's breathing, but I don't know why he's been breathing. Wow. Oh, it makes a stretch. Wow, they're so new. So once they're castrated, they're in here for the first week, and on um, day seven we castrate them, and then they go out there. And then they just share the moms for nursing. Day seven we castrate them. Pretty much from the first week. Oh my goodness, they're just. I think so they like this weather. It's so cozy oh, and. Pile of pigs. Look at the spotted black and white ones. It's so funny. And then there's totally white ones over there. <laughs> they look drunk from nursing. How come the individual pigs and then the large pigs? This is for protection when they're giving birth. Mm -hmm. So that sometimes they give birth out there <laughs> in, the, in the field. No, I meant why, why here it seems to be a couple in a pen and they're individual pens. Oh, well this themselves. is where they give birth mm -hmm. for like the first week and then once we castrate then they go out there. Oh, okay. And then they have access to... Outside. Yeah. Oh my they're goodness. They're a little less sheltered. They're like more hardy and they can handle the elements. How many, um, <laughs> how many pigs do you raise a year? Um, about 300. This is Way from Calgary Creamery. Ah. And we have a tanker truck. We go over to Calgary Creamery in Petaluma. We buy the Way. It's a byproduct of their cheese making facility. And then we feed it to the pigs. And they actually bathe in it in the summer <laughs> to cool off. They just jump in the trough. <laughs> and they tone their skin. Yeah. <laughs> no way. And then these guys are about a month old. After they come out of the breeding or the birthing area, they get they move them into here. See the ones with the white band around their their body is those are the hemp. I'm sure. There's a black mom with the white band. So with the way, um, is that just sort of a, a trade? Stuff you take it off their hands and then or do they pay you to we pick buy it? Up? it. You buy it. Yeah. Okay. For a pretty reasonable price. Okay. But it really helps like when we soak the grain that we raise in that it helps them mm -hmm. consume more be more eager to consume it. I think it helps with digestion. It's all theoretical. Right. <laughs> it's just you well, can it has see. A lot of enzymes in it. Yes, yeah, so you can just see by their behavior that they're way more into it when it's soaked. Yeah. This is not electric right here because this is where we do a lot of the feeding, so it doesn't matter if you touch this part. Oh, they're stinging at all. Hmm. Yum. Oh, they're everywhere right here. And that the uh, the. The sows don't attempt to get out, huh? or the pigs from even though there's no bugs. You've got they you've got don't. Some they're they there. stay where their babies are and where the feed is. They don't. They're really like into the herd thing, so they don't tend to want to go off on their own. That one's got a pretty black stripe in the middle. Uh huh. And so, how much of your grain are you guys raising? How much what? How much of your grain are you raising? Oh, not that much. Maybe twenty five percent. Because they eat a lot. Yeah. <laughs> We don't have enough, there isn't really enough open ground to rent. Right. To do like all on our own. Mm hmm Oh, thunder. And what, what grain do you raise for? We raise barley, triticale, and cow peas. cow peas? Yeah. Like for the legume. Mm hmm and then the rest pretty. of it you, is uh, organic. It's from Modesto Milling okay. or Barrio. So you're pretty. Yeah. Pretty Pellets or crumble. Well, it's actually, we buy it by the truckload and it goes oh. in the silos. Oh, okay. So it's, we order it in bulk. 
So the paddocks continue all the way down there. Um, and then there's a big zone where it's just trees and brush and then there's the creek after that. And those honey, the hives are just housed there. We have a local pollination company and they need space just to um, set their hives. So those aren't actually, we're not renting those. They're just there for the pollination company to have space. Nice. What's the orchard in the distance there? That's walnuts that the neighboring people have and they have olives too. You can see the wild boar traits right here in this mop. She has a longer snout and more wiry, longer yeah. fur. What do you call them? Bristles? Bristles. <laughs> Not fur. <laughs> I don't feel very furry. Feathers. <laughs> Feathers. <laughs> Not, it's like a misnomer. They're domesticated wild boars. Domesticated wild boars, yeah. yeah. European wild, EWB is what we call them. European wild boars. Yeah, so the stock is from Europe, from the wild, but now they're being like raised to breed, or for breeding. And do you find any difference among those animals? Than oh yes, the, the wild ones are better at mothering. They don't step on the, they're like not as inbred. So they're like, their mothering instinct is still intact. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they just, they're really good defenders. Like the mothers are more protective. And I've heard that they sometimes, they can utilize pasture better and move around a little so. more than. Uh, yeah, and they're like the... more lean. They're just like, they're not so clumsy and overgrown and huge. They're not so massive. Like they can use their bodies better than the Durox and the, Sort of more inbred ones. Yeah. <laughs> and what what are the other kinds of breed you have? Duroc, mm -hmm. Hampshire, oh, okay. Chest Chester. Well, we'll see the other ones. I think that's about it. It's like four or five. There's a wild woolly. Oh, woolly. Yep. Oh, Hi, mamas. Oh, they really do look crazy. No, they're domesticated wild boar. They're raised. That one's my favorite. Yeah, I'll show you. Aren't they funny? How many cells about? 60. 60 cells. And that that's, um, keeps you, like, keep, uh, it's not enough. Need demand not enough. No. We could have, like, 120, and it wouldn't be enough. To keep up with demand. Yeah. The demand for these guys is huge. Everybody's really sleepy today. Um, when we harvest them, they're like eight months, and we aim to have them be 250 pounds, like optimal finish weight. And you're saying you have some um, the domesticated wild variety in Duroc? That's the Duroc, Duroc, and then the Hampshire with the belt, uh -huh. and then there's Chester's, they're white. No Tamworths? Um, there might be some in here. Uh -huh. They might be mixed in, I can't remember. And do you... Um, do you do it uh, in terms of like the cross, or like when you save gilts for the new breeding sows? Yeah. Do you do you try to keep it pure? It doesn't matter if it's like crossed or. Oh, we don't. We just we don't mind if it's yeah. crossed. We just go for traits where they'll be the best mothers. Mm -hmm. You can see that one has like a golden overlay, and then dark underneath, yeah. she's like a mix of wild boar yeah, and Dura. Yeah. Is the spotted one, or is, I guess Durax could be spotted. That's just not Oh, is it? Okay. Oh, the underneath <laughs> yeah, the belly? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That's from. We sure are mellow today. Yeah. The female group that we use for the breeding, they're the most tame. <laughs> Take picture. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry, Thunder. These are the boar pens. There are 10 of them, and in each pen, there's one boar and usually one or two females. And they have to be separated, otherwise they fight. Uh -oh. Say that again, there's, there's what? One boar in each pen. We have ten boars uh -huh. for breeding. And then at any given time, there's one to two females okay. with each boar. Right. Is this electrified? This yeah. side isn't, because it's where we feed. Uh-huh. The, I don't think any of it is, actually. Huh. And hey, how do you get the sounds in and out? Oh, there's an alley uh -huh. in the middle uh -huh. that's between like the holding area for the ones that are going into the tunnel. Uh -huh. And we just walk there really eager to be with the male once they are like ready. Right. So they just walk down the alley and then there's a pen door. Mm -hmm. So they just go in. No, I mean, how do you get them out? <laughs> oh, when it's done? How, how They're willing to go out. Like two weeks. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So 
they've had enough male companionship at the end yeah. of that. Yeah. It's a cute pile of things. How do you find uh, selling the pork to the to the uh, restaurants? Oh, it's good. It's people at restaurants tend to want the, either the half animal or the whole animal, uh -huh. and so they do a lot of their own cut. Butchery. They want them, uh, yeah, in their kitchens. Mm -hmm. And is that mostly in this area, or is it in the Bay Area? Or? In the Bay Area. Uh -huh. There, we don't. We do very little sales, like within Yolo County. Not that we don't want to. It just doesn't happen. There are a lot fewer restaurants, I guess. 